This, as you may recognize, is a maintenance service elevator, still in operation, waiting for you. We invite you, if you dare, to step aboard, because in tonight's episode, you are the star. And this elevator travels directly to the Twilight Zone. What is the Twilight Zone? When I first rode the Tower of Terror as a scared out of my mind child, I don't think I had even the slightest clue that this crazy thrill ride had a connection to a 1960s sci-fi anthology series. Even now, I doubt that someone experiencing Orlando or Paris' Tower of Terror that has no prior knowledge of the show would walk away with even a basic understanding of exactly what the Twilight Zone is supposed to be. That pre-show narration claims that we as writers are stepping into an episode, but does the story of the Hollywood Tower Hotel really fit in when compared to the rest of the show? In key ways, I think the version of this famous attraction we are all so familiar with actually fails to capture the spirit of the Twilight Zone, and it took reinterpreting the ride through a different cultural lens to actually deliver a cohesively designed experience in line with Rod Serling's vision. My name is Greg Graberic, and this is the Q-Line Lectures, a series about theme park design. The Twilight Zone is inherently a pretty difficult property to adapt to a ride because of its anthology nature. Without any characters, settings, or plots carried between episodes, there aren't many iconic set pieces just begging to be reimagined as a ride, like the boulder rolling after Indiana Jones. So what does tie one episode of the Twilight Zone to the next? Well, on the surface level, there's all the iconography that wraps each episode, like the intro credits, theme song, and Rod Serling's narration. This is all faithfully transferred over, and I think these pieces really help set the ride's tone, that straddles the line between horror, suspense, and science fiction. Deeper, however, I can't help but feel like the ride completely omits the thematic ties that bind the original series together. With some exceptions, most episodes of the show act as morality tales, exploring some concept of life, death, or philosophy, and imparting a lesson on how one should best behave. These morals weren't shoved aside or tossed in at the end as capping dialogue. Often the whole science fiction concept of the episode is designed around manifesting this theme in some overtly physical way. The characters and world only exist as far as they further the discussion around the central question of the episode, drawing a direct line between theme and character. I'd recommend checking out Big Joel's recent video on The Twilight Zone, where he uses the example of the episode The Mask in which a dying man disfigures his own greedy family with magical masks, and yet his face isn't changed, and he dies peacefully, as an analogy for how the show itself acts as an avenging angel, creating genre-specific traps with which to dole out poetic justice. That undercurrent is something that defines many episodes of The Twilight Zone, and in looking at the original Tower of Terror, I'm not sure how that carries over. In the ride, five strangers, including a young girl and a bellhop, get into an elevator in an upscale 1930s Hollywood hotel, only to be banished to another dimension when the tower is struck by lightning. We don't know much about these people, and we aren't shown anything to make us think this horrific fate is a punishment for anything they've done. Even the ride's final line, the next time you check into a deserted hotel on the dark side of Hollywood, make sure you know just what kind of vacancy you're filling or you may find yourself a permanent resident of the Twilight Zone. (coughs) Fails to offer any kind of overarching moral outside of urging guests to do thorough Yelp research. I don't dislike Tower of Terror, far from it. I just always walk away from it thinking the ride lacks a certain cohesion between the narrative it tries to create, the world it builds, and the IP it's attached to. Not every ride called Tower of Terror left me feeling this way, however. When building a new version of the ride for Disney Sea in Tokyo, Imagineers and the Oriental Land Company decided they need to move away from the Twilight Zone license, which didn't mean much to Japanese parkgoers, and create a brand new experience for the New York waterfront section of the park. While the result is a ride that ditches Ron Serling, it ends up feeling more cohesive, and ironically, more true to the spirit of the Twilight Zone. Key to the Tokyo's ride design is the way it builds its whole story around developing the new character of Harrison Hightower. We rarely actually see rides attempt to create new characters, divorced from any movie or property, but Disney Sea's Tower of Terror shows just how powerful a tool it can be to tie the whole experience together. I think the best evidence for just how well this works is that I left the ride feeling I not only understood exactly what was going on and what kind of person Harrison Hightower is without understanding a single word of Japanese. All the necessary info is communicated economically and non-verbally, 
using a technique often associated with the traditions of Gothic literature, that is, giving thematic importance to architecture. You'll see this idea all over classic Gothic works, but it's something I first encountered reading Anne Radcliffe's 1794 novel The Mysteries of Udolpho, which mostly deals with the potentially supernatural hauntings befalling young Emily St. Aubert after she's held captive in the titular Udolpho castle by Montini, an evil Italian nobleman. As became typical for the Gothic tradition, the castle itself comes to represent the mental states of the characters that inhabit it, with all the hidden rooms, secret passageways, and cavernous crypts symbolizing the dark secrets of each character. It's a clear straight line between character and architecture, and that's cleverly how Tokyo's Tower of Terror explains Harrison Hightower. Just looking at the outside of the tower tells us a decent bit of information before we even step inside. Unlike the Spanish or Pueblo style of the other attractions, this one uses a Moorish revival style. The use of bricks helps it blend in the New York waterfront area of the park and is period accurate to the turn of the century setting when compared to a contemporary like the Tampa Bay Hotel. The Moorish revival style is a notable choice though, as its popularity grew in a time where fascination with globalism and orientalism were on the rise, so it accordingly appropriates many elements from traditional Turkish, Ottoman, and Islamic architecture, like minarets, horseshoe arches, and domes. This gives off the impression that Hightower is perhaps a worldly person, but also that he isn't afraid to, let's generously say, take inspiration in the works of other cultures. I also really like the way the exterior is less decrepit than the other towers, which does a better job communicating Hightower's wealth and opulence, with only crackles of green energy on the exterior, giving away hints of a supernatural corruption. Stepping inside, we'll see that the lobby informs us more on Hightower's worldly expeditions, as it's decorated with artifacts and styles from all around the world. It's interesting that many of the artifacts you'll notice first are seemingly Egyptian in origin, as that brings to mind the sordid history of British explorers stealing artifacts from that region. Looking higher up in the room, we see murals showing how Hightower acquired all of his prized possessions. I think these strike a balance between not so subtly showing us the cost of his exploits, like the way he ignores his overworked assistant, and of course the angry native people trying to reclaim their stolen goods, while also framing Hightower just heroically enough that it's believable he would display them in his own hotel. It's a nice touch too that many of the artifacts shown in the murals can also be found around the queue. The best part of the lobby, however, is the giant stained glass window, with a portrait of Hightower and a quote that reads, The world is mine oyster, which I with sword shall open. This quote from Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor, spoken by the boastful and cowardly ancient Pistol, is actually the origin of that expression, The world is my oyster. It's ironic then that we mostly use it today as a naively optimistic phrase, when taken in the original context, it's actually meant to be a bit more villainous. Especially with the extra context of, which I with sword shall open, it's clear that we probably shouldn't be happy these two men feel the whole world is ripe for their taking. Moving on to the pre-shows, these work to establish the foil to Harrison Hightower, the idol Shariki Utundu. The first is an interest spiel given by a cast member entirely in Japanese, but simply reintroduces Hightower and informs you of the misfortune that befell him after returning home with the mystical idol he found in an unexplored region of Africa. In the study, we hear an old gramophone recording of the press conference, where Hightower brags about how difficult it was for him to steal Shariki Utundu from the natives. Then the stained glass window magically changes as Shariki Utundu takes control and we hear a much more regretful Hightower warn us that we shouldn't go any further because the idol really is cursed. This is followed by one of what I think is Disney's greatest effects, as the previously statuesque Utundu makes a creepy smile before disappearing seemingly into thin air. Like the pre-shows of the other towers, I think this one is so effective because of the close cramped quarters it takes place in. It gives the scenes a sense of intimacy that wouldn't be possible in a much larger room, similar to how old dark rides feel so much scarier because you can almost reach out and touch the props. It makes the disappearance of Shariki Utundu even more magical to see it from just a few feet away, where you can spend a few moments looking around trying to figure out just how they pulled that off, rather than it being just another optical trick for the ride vehicle to zoom by. Instead of a boiler room, the loading platform has now become the storage room for all the artifacts. I think this room works best as a reminder of Hightower's excess. He's taken so many things that he needs an entirely separate room just to store them, and without a place to display them, they serve no purpose at all. He's stolen them simply because from his point of view, they could be taken. Once we board our elevators, the ride experience is very familiar to anyone who's ridden a version of this ride. 
It seems Harrison is now cursed to live out his death over and over again, with Sharik Yutundu crashing his elevator. I like the very small touch added that Harrison is re-experiencing the cursed elevator with us, because it reinforces the idea that this is his punishment, and we are merely observers to it. We rise up to a large mirror where Atundu now fully curses us with his glowing green eyes, and the long sequence of drops begin. After all the chaos dies down, we see Utundu's eyes one last time, as Hightower warns us not to become too attracted to this type of danger, and never to return. I don't think I need to spell out the theme of the ride at this point, because as you've seen, basically every design choice here works towards telling that story, of the dangers of colonialism and cultural theft. Much like I mentioned with the Twilight Zone, Harrison Hightower and Shariki Utundu aren't as much fleshed out characters, as they are embodiments of the thematic points they represent. Hightower is your typical Twilight Zone wrongdoer, stubborn to a fault and only a death able to see the error of his ways. Shariki Utundu may look like a villain, but he has a lot more in common with the old man from The Mask, acting as a perverse hand of moral and thematic justice. With this, we see how Tokyo's Tower of Terror is designed with a direct hierarchy, where the theme informs the characters, which in turn dictates the architecture of the physical spaces themselves. It's this three-tier system of connections that I think creates the cohesive feeling that elevates this tower above the rest. This approach was so successful that when it came time to remake California's tower into a Marvel experience, the influence of Disney Sea is impossible to ignore. Without diving too deep into all the similarities, you enter the home of a self-centered artifact collector only to get caught up in the conflict between the collector and an angry member of his collection. Sounds pretty familiar, huh? Mission Breakout shows how powerful just that gothic link between character and design can be, even though it seemingly lacks the thematic weight of Disney Sea's Tower of Terror. Thinking more on that theme, it's worth diving deeper into why Disney chose colonialism as their target for the attraction in Tokyo. Not only are they an American company that is always expanding abroad, but they historically have faced much blowback for the way they chose to take from other cultures, be it recent stories like the trademarking of the Swahili Hakuna Matata, the similarities of the Lion King to the Japanese Kimba the White Lion, or even the way Moana, Lilo and Stitch, and Pocahontas choose to portray native people. Disney often finds itself embattled, much like Harrison Hightower himself. Even Otter, it's interesting that Imagineer Joe Rohde was actually used as the facial model for Hightower. While never controversial, Rohde is famous for traveling to exotic locations around the world, collecting art and inspiration for attractions like Expedition Everest and Flight of Passage. So is this entire Tower of Terror an act of self-critique? I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but at the very least, it shows how fuzzy the line can be between respecting a foreign culture and stealing from it. So what is the Twilight Zone? I'd argue the show's lasting appeals come not from its crazy sci-fi ideas, but from using that frame to tell thematically compelling fables, and it's that spirit I think Disney sees Tower of Terror carries forward. It expands a theme into a character, and then uses that character to inform every aspect of the physical design. It's a package that's equal parts thrills, scares, and story, and it's so good that once you check into the Hotel Hightower, well, you might never check out.